A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, it is a period of civil war. Rebel spaceships, striking from a hidden base, have won their first victory against the evil Galactic Empire. During the battle, rebel spies managed to steal secret plans to the Empire's ultimate weapon, the Death Star, a space station with enough power to destroy an entire planet. Pursued by the Empire's sinister agents, Princess Leia races home aboard her starship, custodian of the stolen plans that can save her people and restore freedom to the galaxy. So that Dominic was Dave Prowse, bodybuilder. What was he? The Green Cross Code Man. He was. And the actor who played Darth Vader in Star Wars. And of course, I was reading there the, um, the opening to Star Wars, that kind of scroll that appears. And I wanted to go with Dave Prowse because um, I actually met him. Oh, crikey. Well done, Tom. When I was 10, yeah. the year that Star Wars came out in uh, Britain, um, he came in his Darth, Darth Vader robes to Salisbury Library. Wow. And I was startled when I heard him speak. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, <laughs> because because of course um, this is not the voice that he actually gets in the film, is it, Darth no, Vader? No, no, it's all kind of oh, Luke, oh, all that kind of. Is stuff. that James L. Jones there, Tom, making his yeah. guest appearance? Yeah, <sighs> all that kind of oh, thing. Wonderful, um, but um, very much part of my childhood memories, Star Wars. Yeah, um, and uh, we are going to look at it, but with a kind of very distinctive angle, a historically themed angle today. Yes, because this episode is really well. I mean, you wanted to call it. Romans in Space. I did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is a great title, actually, Tom. It's a very good title. So so you saw Star Wars. Did you see Star Wars when it first came out? Yeah, I did. And were you... Did you th About 400 times. Did you? You thought it was good? Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was great. Yeah, I can... I um. I remember laughing at the Grand Moff Tarkin. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, we'll come back to uh, to Governor Tarkin um, in, in, a, in about 15 minutes or so. Um, yeah, I was totally obsessed with Star Wars as a boy so you know child of the early 70s i think i probably there must have been a point in my life where i thought about star wars every single day for hours you know about a three-year period where i just thought about han and luke and one and i had all the toys i had all rather the... in the way that um american men think about the roman empire and perhaps, <laughs> you know and perhaps perhaps there's a kind of link there because we're going to be exploring the roman dimensions of this story but dominic as a historian of modern america yeah can, before we get on to the Romans, can you just um, situate Star Wars in the 1970s and kind of give a sense of its historical significance as a cultural artifact? Oh, very good, Tom. We love a cultural artifact. So, um, yeah, well, Star Wars is a product of the 1970s. I mean, it's 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 um, now this long at this great distance. You can see how it completely and utterly reflects the era of Vietnam and Watergate and the sort of disillusionment that had set in with the Nixon presidency and after. So it's progenitor George Lucas is your sort of classic um, sort of baby boom, uh, sort of suburban, slightly disaffected, slightly idealistic kind of nerd, a bit like Steven Spielberg. So he was born in a place called Modesto, California, which is basically, it's not that far from San Francisco in Northern California. It's just a nondescript sort of middle-class American suburban town. Lucas is a very sort of nerdy young man. He goes to University of Southern California and he studies film. And and he's part of this generation that come into cinema in the late 60s, early 70s. And like his friend Francis Ford Coppola, who is very close friends with, who made The Godfather. Lucas is slightly different because he's always very, he's always quite a nostalgic um, filmmaker. So his his big breakthrough is a film called American Graffiti, which is kind of looking back to the 1950s. And he came up with the idea for Star Wars in the early 1970s, at the point at which the Nixon presidency was imploding. Because I gather, having read a bit around this, that the evil Emperor Palpatine, who again we may mention later in yes. the show, um, was based on Nixon, according to, yeah, so, to Lucas. Is that true or not? I don't know how true that is, Tom. I think it's one of those things. Lucas has given about six billion interviews and he sort of says, well, he was, there was a bit of Nixon in him. And people say, oh, well, in that case, the emperor is definitely Nixon. Um, but I think, obviously, you know, the idea of an evil authority figure for people of Lucas's generation and his kind of 
cultural sensibility, Nixon was the great villain. And the other thing that he's always said about it is that he was inspired by Joseph Campbell, who was yeah. a, a great writer on mythology um, and the idea of universal hero. Yes. And that became, I mean, I remember first reading about that when I was a student. I thought, gosh, how unbelievably fascinating. Star Wars is so much deeper and more sophisticated than I, <laughs> than I ever imagined. And actually, I think now people think this is probably not quite true. Window dressing. This is window dressing that was that was sort of retro. It was, um, Lucas was looking back in, like, I don't know, the 1980s or 1990s or something and made an offhand remark. And then people ran with it and turned it into this sort of great... Um, this great enterprise teasing out all the links between Star Wars and kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, ancient Indian mythology or something. Right. But we are going to do something similar with the Romans, aren't we? But before, just before we come on to that, for people who haven't seen Star Wars, and there are definitely people who haven't. I mean, my daughters have never watched it. Oh, crikey. Um, well, I tried to make them watch it and they got so bored that they drifted off. So I think I think it is a kind of period piece, although it's kind of they they've done multiple reworkings of it haven't they yeah. over the years um the the salient thing in in that um the opening that i read so beautifully mm -hmm. is that it's set in space yeah it's science fiction but it happens a long time ago so can you just give just give us the very basic plot very very quickly the setting for people who haven't seen it so essentially what george lucas has want, want to, had wanted to do was to remake flash gordon so Flash Gordon was this story about a guy who's catapulted into space. He gets goes in the Flash. Ah, uh, oh, I should never have savior of the universe. I really bitterly now regret bringing up <laughs> you Flash Gordon. Into that yeah, one. I did. Um, <laughs> so Flash Gordon, very popular in the nineteen thirties, uh, a comic and then a kind of film serial. Lucas wanted to get the rights to to do this this family friendly story about a guy who's catapulted into space and he has all of these amazing adventures fighting an evil empire. He couldn't do that, so he writes basically his own version of Flash Gordon. But what distinguishes Star Wars from sort of pulp science fiction generally is that the very first film, he incorporates his kind of film school training. So there's lots of stuff, um, lots of references to John Ford's film, The Searchers, or Kurosawa's Japanese films like The Hidden Fortress. And the plot is that, that Princess Leia, who we heard about in the thing, she's got these plans. Uh, it Yes. They get attacked. She gets captured by Darth Vader, who's an evil bloke wearing black robes. Right. Um, something happens. That, oh, two robots. Yeah. They crash on a planet. They get found by uh, Luke Skywalker, who is the kind of King Arthur figure. Yes. Luke is, Luke is absolutely, he is, he is Arthur. And the sword from the stone is the lightsaber that is given by this old wizard. Uh, I say wizard. He's referred to as a wizard at one point. He's kind of the Obi Wan Kenobi. Obi Wan Kenobi, who's Kenobi. Kind of the Merlin of yes, the, whole the Merlin proceedings. of the whole enterprise. They go on this expedition to try and rescue the princess. Uh, Theo, quite rightly, is saying Ben Kenobi because he's really mainly called Ben rather than Obi Wan in the very first film. The first film was actually a bit of an outlier. There are lots of things that we think of as being sort of typical of Star Wars that aren't in the first film, or the first film deviates from them. Anyway, we don't need to go into that. Anyway, but they, but they 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 have to go on. A, basically, the MacGuffin is that they they have these plans, and they have to use them to blow up the, this Death Star that otherwise will kill everyone. And this is what happens, and they do it. He meets rogues, and he create has this little uh, team of friends who go on the expedition. There's a slight Lord of the Rings element to it, the idea of going on the expedition. And uh, surprise, surprise, it all ends happily, and they get medals at the end, except for Chewbacca, who is denied a medal. Tom in the Triumph of the Will reenactment scene. <laughs> yes, because basically, rather oddly, it all goes very Nazi at the end, doesn't it? it? Well, it we does talked a bit. about that. <laughs> yes. So um, we wanted to, to focus particularly on Rome, because this is the thing that is often the, the historical period that is often seen as uh, as inspiring Star Wars. And, and well, Dominic, yes. just hold on, just but just before we come, I mean, just to pick up again on that Lenny Riefenstahl thing. So we talked about her uh, in the series that we just finished about the Nazis. We did. Um, that, that her portrayal of Hitler at the Nuremberg rallies inspires the ending of Star Wars, where there's this kind of masked rally. Yeah. I suppose there is a kind of Nazi interface, isn't there, between George Lucas making this film and the Romans, that the Romans kind of are standing in for the Nazis in quite a lot of uh, the way that um, the Romans are seen. Yeah, absolutely. So the Nazis, we, we, we did our series about the Nazis in power. We were talking about Nazi iconography and Nazi propaganda. The Nazis were often looking back to Rome, weren't they? I mean, the Eagle Standards, yeah. the, 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 the very idea of those sort of Nazi rallies, the idea of kind of the mass ranks of, of stormtroopers, the SA, or members of the Wehrmacht in their sort of shining helmets. And their eagles. And, and their, their eagles standards. and their standards. I mean, the whole thing is very clearly based on this, it, 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 it very clearly aping what, in the early 20th century, 
people thought was kind of standard Roman imperial iconography. Don't you think, Tom? And so, and so Darth Vader and, and the Empire command stormtroopers, yes. which is obviously an allusion back to the Nazis. Are they legions as well? Is that, I mean, is that something that is being played with, do you think? Or is this, again, kind of academics perhaps overthinking? That might be academics overthinking. I don't think the word legions is ever used, certainly not uh, I'm aware of in the first three films in the original trilogy. I mean, there are, so, there are clues throughout that. Let's concentrate on that first film, the original film, which came out in the US in 77 and in Britain in 78. There are sort of clues, as it were. There are Roman hints. So you had a mention of the Empire in the, in the opening crawl that you read, Tom, so beautifully. Um, the only character who's mentioned in that opening text is Princess Leia. And she's the first one, apart from Darth Vader, of the principals that we meet in the film. And she is um, wearing, she's, she's quite classically dressed. So she's wearing this sort of long flowing white robe, uh, almost a little bit like a toga. Or, I mean, some classical scholars say she looks like a vestal virgin. I mean, also, she has this, this famous hairstyle, doesn't she? The kind of twin cinnamon buns on either yes. side, which, um, again, I remember reading, may have been inspired by um, a, a fourth century BC statue found in Spain, the Lady of Elche, yes. where she has identical kind of identical Absolutely. hairstyle. Absolutely. If people want to look that up, you look at the Lady of Elche, who's supposedly, possibly uh, Hellenistic or even Carthaginian, people think. She does have Princess Leia's hairstyle. Extraordinary. Anyway, so Leia, um, she looks kind of classical. When she's captured by Darth Vader and the stormtroopers, she she mentions, she protests. She says the Imperial Senate will not stand for this. So we have this idea that there's a Senate. We're then introduced to Luke Skywalker, who's the King Arthur, as you said. He is a farm boy. And basically his story is that of a kind of somebody. It's, it's, a, it's King Arthur in the Wild West. So he's on a kind of the Western frontier. He's a farm boy. It's very sort of, you know, the American prairie. Um, uh, but he is wearing, he similarly is wearing clothes that an extra would wear in a market scene in, a, in, a, in Cleopatra. <laughs> yes, yes. Or a biblical Exactly, epic. exactly. And he talks very excitedly about a rebellion against the empire, you know, which is very kind of, I don't know, Jewish revolt or something. He meets this character, Ben Kenobi, who is a kind of hermit stroke wizard. He's a bit like a stylite from the sixth century, Tom. Mm. You know, he's a man of the yeah, desert. A man of the desert. He, yeah, same He meets the Ben, and it's actually Ben who gives us a lot of the, well, what backstory there is. So Ben says to Luke, for over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the old Republic, before the dark times, before the Empire. So there he's sounding like a kind of a senator under Caligula or right, somebody. Right, exactly, exactly. So there you have um, established in those lines the kind of the premise for the whole thing, that there has been this, this, this utopian republic and something has gone wrong. Corruption has set in and it has been replaced by a repressive empire. And the one other bit of politics we have in the whole film is when this character... Governor Tarkin, who is played by... This is the Grand Moff right, Tarkin. Right, Grand Moff Tarkin. Um, he, so Lucas had two, basically had two good actors in Star Wars, both British, both kind of prestigious. So he had Alec Guinness, who was Ben Kenobi, and he had his, his, his sort of opposite number, as it were, was Peter Cushing playing the guy who's running the Death Star, Governor Tarkin. Governor Peter Cushing was the kind of star of Hammer House Horror. So he was always... Either playing vampires or killing. Yes, vampires. he was either Van, he was Van Helsing, he was Sherlock Holmes, he was the actor you would go to if you were doing a, a film about one of those characters, or he'd be Dracula. And Governor Tarkin goes into a meeting of basically Nazi officers on the Death Star. They're they're clearly dressed as you know Hitler's high command, circa nineteen forty two. And Governor Tarkin says to them, "I've just had news. The Imperial Senate will not, no longer be of any concern to us. I've just received word the Emperor has dissolved the Council permanently. The last remnants of the old Republic have been swept away. The regional governors now have direct control over the territories. Fear will keep the local systems in line. Fear of this battle station. Right. So that could be kind of obviously drawing on uh, the, the ocean of um, Hitler abolishing the Weimar Republic. I mean, that would be, I suppose so, a, yes, an obvious illusion. Yes. But but the the clearer illusion is to the collapse of the Roman Republic and the identification of the Roman Republic with political liberty and the replacement by Augustus and his heirs of um, the Republican system with an autocratic. Absolutely, system. in the sense that the Senate is which which Leia Leia is somehow connected with that she and the other senators have been part of what appears to have been a kind of patrician talking shop 
which and our senses this has somehow been allowed to continue and it's withered and now the emperor has done away with it altogether that is all we get actually because i have to say when i watched it i was obsessed by the romans i was in my kind of peak childhood roman obsession but i didn't really pick up any of that when i watched star wars i mean i so i've read lots about how star wars is roman but in that film it seems pretty buried i have to say well the funny thing about it is star wars now has this huge mythology you know that enthusiasts and indeed lucasfilm have created i mean the number of books star wars spin-off books and tv series and whatnot and comics is is vast um but in the first film i think the one of the reasons the first film is successful is that a little bit like tolkien its credibility lies in the fact that it hints at this deeper history, yeah. but it doesn't show it. So actually, you know, it's very exciting for a 10-year-old to think, gosh, there was an old republic and there was all this stuff. Yeah. But they never show it because that would probably be a bit disappointing, as indeed it was to prove. The, but a contrast with Tolkien, this isn't to diss Lucas, but I mean, Tolkien was a great scholar who knew vast, vast amounts about antiquity yeah. and was very, very skilled at drawing in and weaving together really quite learned and academic references to ancient history. Yes. George Lucas is not doing that, no. is he? I mean, he's not, he's interested in film. He's not interested oh, right. in, yeah. I don't know, Roman his, history. His knowledge of Rome is that which you would expect. A, 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 reason, a reasonably, a, a well-educated, intelligent, you know, a graduate of the University of Southern California who studied film, He's not, he's not sitting up at night reading Sallust. You know, I mean, I don't think we should hold him to unfair standards. The one interesting thing about Star Wars is that right from the beginning, it generates this huge industry. So one of the things, I mean, one of the things that comes out almost straight away is a novelization. And actually, there's much more in the novelization. I had the novelization as a boy and I loved it. And one of the things I actually loved was this. So it was ghostwritten for George Lucas by a sort of pulp science fiction writer called Alan Dean Foster. And there was a long description right at the beginning of how the Old Republic gave way to the Empire. The Old Republic was the Republic of Legend under the wise rule of the Senate and the protection of the Jedi Knights. But as so often happens when wealth and power pass beyond the admirable and attain the awesome, there appear those evil ones who have greed to match. So it was with the Republic at its height. Like the greatest of trees, able to withstand any external attack, the Republic rotted from within, though the danger was not visible from outside. And then this is actually this. It's in the book, not the film, that it, we are, it is told, we are told how restless, power-hungry individuals within the government, aided with, by the massive organs of commerce, propelled the campaign of the ambitious Senator Palpatine, who promised to reunite the disaffected among the people and to restore the remembered glory of the Republic. And so he surrounds himself, as it says, by bootlickers. So this is Julius Caesar. Palpatine is Julius Caesar. Well, is he Julius Caesar or is he Augustus, Tom? I mean, it's well, I think he beca he's then he's then Augustus when he proclaims himself emperor, right? So he's it's a, it's a kind of a blurring of very very negative portrayals of Caesar and of. Augustus. And I think what's fascinating about this, what I find interesting about this, is all of that stuff. I'm sure Alan Dean Foster and George Lucas didn't think very much about it. I'm sure this wasn't conscious, but that idea that the empire, that the republic, that the whole enterprise was destroyed from within. It couldn't be destroyed from without. It was destroyed from within. And it was destroyed by people hungry for power, by bootlickers um, and the organs of commerce and, and all of this sort of thing. I think that's quite Gibbonian. It's 18th century American specifically. Yes. Because America is founded with this idea that it's a republic. You know, Benjamin Franklin famously says it will be a republic if you can keep it. And that anxiety that the republic might collapse and be replaced by an autocracy as Rome had been. And the American Republic is founded on the Roman Republic. I mean, that is... Uh, I, I I don't know the degree to which this is something that American students study in their history classes, but it must. It's kind of in the air. The fact that um, the, the the look the visuals of the American Republic are so Roman means that that has always been an anxiety. Well, that anxiety, that fear of ambition, corruption. I mean, the mention of commerce and, and wealth, the idea, the fear of luxury. Those are very 18th century ideas, aren't they? And they were very popular on both sides of the Atlantic um, in the political yeah. classes. And so Gibbon, when he wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, you know, he moved in circles where people were dissing luxury and dissing ambition and corruption all the time. And that sort of idea that great empires or great republics are undermined 
by um, by the decadence and the degeneracy of their ruling classes, and then a strong man will arise to take power. I mean, we all have that to some degree, don't we? I mean, we've absorbed it from popular do, culture. Yes. And it, but here's my question on on that. Yeah, um, you, you're talking about how you know these books are written to tie in with the success of Star Wars. And then in due course, George Lucas revisits the Star Wars universe and he comes up with three films yes. that trace the, emer you know, we discover who Darth Vader is, his backstory. And I, the backdrop to this is the implosion of the Republic and its replacement by an empire. But Dominic, just, yeah. just a question I wanted to ask you was, presumably this was not in Lucas's mind when he first made Star Wars. Is this stuff that basically, you know, People have scholars and enthusiasts and geeks have been poring over it and they have they have kind of drawn out these echoes. And is George Lucas then thinking, oh, wow, <laughs> it's it's cleverer than I thought or, you know, it has more echoes than I thought. And is he perhaps kind of responding to that? I think um, possibly to some extent, Tom. So um, Lucas said uh, after Star Wars became successful, he said, well, I have had, I, I actually this is actually episode four. Now, it wasn't initially branded as episode four. So that when you went to the, when you went to see Star Wars in 1977, it didn't say Episode Four, but when I went to see it, when it was re-released really in 1980, when The Empire Strikes Back came out, they had put on the Episode Four branding because I can remember saying to my dad at the cinema, "We've made a terrible mistake. We've come late. This is the fourth episode, and <laughs> we've missed the first three. So at that point, Lucas was already now whether he was really intending to make these prequels, I I, I suspect probably not. He sort of would airily talk about it. But again, it added to the sense of a deep history. You know, actually, you're coming in the middle of the story. And people loved that. But the first, the first, those first three episodes, which I, I saw the first one, I thought it was so dull. I mean, I'd really rather have watched a film about uh, trade negotiations well, you did. in Brussels. <laughs> well, you did. You mean The yeah, Phantom Menace? What it is. The Phantom yes. Menace is what we're talking about. Um, yeah. But th so those three films, are, are the, the allusions to Rome clearer in those? Are they more overt? They're much more overt. So not necessarily in The Phantom Menace. I mean, these, by the way, for the avoidance of doubt. Uh, now, some of our listeners may like these films. I have to be honest and say, although I love Star Wars, I absolutely loathe these films. Anyway, that's by the by. Um, they are more overt. So the story, the theme is the emergence of this Elper Palpatine. I think what made it so disappointing for people of my age is that we had built up, we had our own private versions, you know, as people tend to do, like people did with the Ford of Numenor and the Lord of the Rings. So yeah. We had our own vision of what this would have looked like. And then when it, you discover it's sort of computer generated, uh, Jar Jar Binks, aliens and whatever, it's just so depressing. Anyway, um, yeah, the one thing that is quite interesting is the emergence of this guy, Palpatine. He, the, he is generated... Um, he has secretly generated, Tom, all these sort of civil wars and separatist movements in order to be given emergency powers to deal with them. And so he's given these emergency powers in the film Attack of the Clones. And he's very august. I mean, I think Augustus is the better comparison than Julius Caesar. He is given by the Senate these powers. And he says to them, it is with great reluctance that I've agreed to this calling. I love democracy. I love the Republic. Once this crisis has abated, I will lay down the powers you have given me. Of course, that is a Roman idea that someone mm. will be awarded the powers dictator. of a dictator and then will yeah. surrender them. And then in the final film of that prequel trilogy, Revenge of the Sith, he orchestrates a series of prescriptions sort of uh, like the prescriptions that claim the life of, of Cicero, the prescriptions of Antony and Octavian. And again, you think here this is a deliberate echo, um, do you think? Is it a deliberate? I don't know how deliberate it is. There's also something lighter than the Long Knives about it, I guess, a sort of internal yeah, purge, okay. the, the yeah. massacre of the Jedi Knights. And then there's this scene, which is often sort of mocked on social media where he stands in um, I mean he's surrounded by kind of gibbering aliens and flying saucers and he says in order to ensure our security and continuing stability the republic will be reorganized into the first galactic empire for a safe and secure society and natalie portman's character queen amidala who's luke and leia's mother she says uh, very earnestly so this is how liberty dies with thunderous applause and again, right. so she is the Cicero of exactly, the Star Wars world. Exactly. Yeah. So again, there is an obvious, you know, this is Rome in the era of Augustus and Tiberius or whatever, that the Senate 
has basically, in, in its sort of supine way, is handing over power to a power-hungry, malevolent character who affects this modesty, as of course Augustus did, but in reality um, is as, as more ruthless um, than anybody. Now, there's an Australian classical scholar called Michael Charles um, who wrote an article about this in, in, the, in the journal Classical World, Remembering and Restoring the Republic, his uh, journal. And he says, one of the funny things about this, he says, um, is that, and again, this is completely unconscious, I think, is that in Rome, people who criticised, you know, people who were ambivalent about the rise of Julius Caesar, most obviously, and then I suppose Augustus, tended to be they were the patrician elite weren't they tom they were what they call what do you call them the bonnie so the, these are the people who look back you know who are, are upholders of tradition who um identify themselves with uh, all that is best in roman tradition and who have to be incredibly rich yeah and the sense is in the star wars universe that all the defenders of the republic are very very poor they and are rich i mean they're, they're literally princesses they are right absolutely and queens yes. and so so yeah. so the person who says that line about liberty dying is Queen Amidala. Her daughter um, is um, Princess Leia. And Princess Leia is the person who carries the torch of kind of republicanism. Well, so, so um, I mean, this will be familiar to people who, who may not have read books on Roman history, but have seen Gladiator, where in Gladiator you have the evil emperor, Commodus. Yes. And then you have Derek Jacobi playing the Senate, which is the, the guardian of Rome's ancient liberties. Um, and... I'm just wondering this sense of the kind of the Roman character in Star Wars might it actually I mean it it might not be coming from Gibbon but it might be coming from those kind of Roman epics it, it um, absolutely because obviously Gladiator is is post Star Wars but you had all those epics Ben Hur for the Roman Empire all that kind of thing and actually in those it's the British who are who are the baddies yeah. and the Americans who are who are the freedom fighters and indeed the Christians because the Jedi could be you know there are kind of echoes of the way that early christians play the role in quo vadis yes. or yeah. you know demetrius and the gladiators things like that. that i think that's totally right tom um and in fact there's a there's a scholar who who has written lots about this who agrees with you called martin winkler and he's tremendous to know he has pointed out that alec guinness who plays um ben kenobi obi-wan kenobi he had he would have been well known to American audiences for a whole host of roles, but one of them was playing Marcus Aurelius in the film The Fall of the oh, Roman of Empire in 1964. Yes, the film that is the direct model for Gladiator. I mean, Gladiator is really a remake of The Fall of the Roman Empire. Now, and and it's just, you know Marcus Aurelius, this sort of stoical character, philosophical. Um, he dies in the course of the film. I mean, there, there are kind of parallels you can tease out with his Ben Kenobi character. And actually, both Martin Winkler and this guy I mentioned earlier, what was his name, Michael Charles, they point out that Star Wars shares what they call a linguistic paradigm with those toga films of the 50s and 60s. So Spartacus, Quo Vadis, Ben-Hur, and so on. So in Star Wars, a character like Han Solo, Harrison Ford's character, the kind of rogue, um, who's yeah, like a wise cracking... Yeah. Yeah. Who's like a, a, a character who's fallen out of a Western or something. Yeah. Uh, he, he speaks like somebody in sort of 1960s America. So he says famously, I mean, his most famous line is, I have a bad feeling about this. Now, you contrast that with the character we mentioned earlier, Peter Cushing's Governor Tarkin. Tarquin, by the way, Tarquin the Proud, Tom. Yeah, of course. The last king yes, of the, uh, the, the last Roman king. The incarnation of tyranny. And Governor Tarkin. I mean, one of the first things he says, he's talking to Princess Unleash Leia. Unleash the death rate. He says, he never says thing. unleash the death rate. Tom. He says, charming to the last. You don't know how hard, how hard I found it, signing the order to terminate your life. So he speaks like a sort yeah. of American parody of a, you know, it's like Mel Gibson's The Patriot or something. Yeah. And, and actually, this is directly copying what happened in all of those Roman epics. So in all those... But also kind of Pontius Pilate. Yeah, um, no, yeah, I guess so. It pains me to sentence you to death, Nazarene. <laughs> um, <All that. laughs> um, so um, in all those Roman epics, the hero is American. So Charlton Heston, obviously in, in Ben-Hur, or Kirk Douglas and Spartacus, and they have American accents and they speak in a mid-century way. But the villains are always British speaking in an old-fashioned clipped way. So Peter Ustinov's Nero, I mean, Laurence Olivier as Crassus in, um, in Spartacus. Yes. Uh, and indeed, the two Commodus's are both played by North American actors affecting British accents. So Christopher Plummer 
who sounds very British anyway, actually. And friend then, of the uh, show. yes, friend of the show from uh, The Sound of Music and um, Joaquin Phoenix in Gladiator. And obviously what this reflects is, the, is this, again, probably unconsciously, is the identification of Britishness with kind of empire, it, yeah. with cruel, cruelty and oppression. And that's how we yeah. like it, Tom, to be honest. And, and people with American accents in these toga epics tend to be, as you say, Christian martyrs, Jewish freedom fighters, um, all of those kinds of things. And this presumably is why George Lucas wouldn't allow uh, Dave Prowse to, um, to actually speak. Yes. In because it would give away the fact. Luke, I am your father. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it wouldn't work, would it? Now, the funny thing about the Toga epics is that they themselves, of course, are products of a particular political moment because they're Cold War stories. So lots of film scholars have said, you know, the, th the film, that these films project, I mean, what, they, what, they're, what they're selling is a, a conflict between, on the one hand, democracy and freedom, and on the other, um, totalitarianism. Okay. Yeah. So the Roman Empire stands in for uh, the Soviet Empire, although interestingly, Spartacus was written by a guy called Dalton Trumbo, who had been He's communist. Yeah, blacklisted. Yeah. And there is an argument that actually the films are also about the anxieties of empire, you know, and the anxieties of power and all that. So I think what you could say is the idea that Star Wars is an allegory of Roman history isn't true. I mean, it's it's it that would be to over dignify it or perhaps to to simplify it, because actually. Um, this is a, a merging and a kind of mixing of all kinds of vaguely understood historical ideas. So the villains in Star Wars are uh, Nixon's Republicans. They are the Nazis. They are the Soviets. They are the British in the Revolutionary War. Yeah. And they are the Romans. And perhaps the Romans lie you know, as, as the furthest back. And that sense that Star Wars is set in the distant past, the ancient past, it's that kind of Roman quality does give it a, a, a pattern of, of, yeah. of class that it might not and otherwise I think have. What that actually, what that also depends upon, Tom, is the way in which ro the idea of Roman history is built into the American Republic from the very yeah. beginning. So the idea, well, I mean, that's how they set it up, right? They didn't say, let's yeah. become a new American empire. They said there'd be a republic, the founding fathers, George the Washington. Senate. Yeah, Senate, Capitol. the Capitol, yep. George Washington being Cincinnatus. And that fear, we've talked about this so many times on The Rest is History, that fear, which is built into Americanness, that the yeah. republic could one day become an empire, right. become a dick, that terror that that could that fate is at hand and that's actually what animates George Lucas's um moral political universe it's the fear that the exemplar that shadows it is the end of the roman republic but there is of course another uh decline and fall that can be adduced from roman history which is the collapse of the empire itself mm -hmm. and that also has been i think incredibly influential on science fiction perhaps less so in film more so in um in literature and we know that george lucas was influenced by perhaps the most celebrated of all these kind of fictional reworkings of the decline and fall of the roman empire um and i think we should take a break now and when we come back dominic perhaps you'd allow me to have a look at that i would love that tom i thank I, you very I, much fact, do you know what i can't wait i absolutely can't wait see you after the break Galactic Empires reached the cinema with this group of films, which here and there offered more than a whiff of the foundation. No, I don't mind. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and I certainly imitated Edward Gibbon, so I can scarcely object if someone imitates me. That was the very well-spoken Isaac Asimov. <laughs> who, knew he, he, who knew he came from the Cotswolds? <laughs> that was Isaac Asimov, Tom, uh, and he was talking about Star Wars. So Isaac Asimov there says he's detected more than a whiff of the foundation in uh, George Lucas's yeah. Star Wars saga. So Isaac Asimov is one of those names that if, you, if you're not very familiar with science fiction, you've probably heard the name, but you don't know who he is. So, Tom, who is Isaac Asimov? So Asimov actually didn't come from the Cotswolds. He came from Russia. Um, and his family emigrated to America in 1923. I think he was about three. He was intellectually brilliant, um, brilliant scientist, uh, but also fascinated by history and literature. And he, he became probably the most celebrated science fiction writer uh, of the 20th century. 
I would guess. So he's probably famous for three things. The first is his enormous uh, mutton chops. He had absolutely <laughs> huge sideburns. Secondly, and there's been quite a lot of talk about this recently because of AI, he came up with these um, the three laws of robotics, which is kind of basically designed to stop robots from killing you. Right, yes. So there's quite a lot of discussion about should these actually be enshrined. And the third is he wrote this... Um, kind of massively massively influential se series of novels called foundation and there's a tv series i think on apple, apple at the yeah. moment which came out in the in the early 50s um three novels foundation foundation and empire second foundation and this was directly inspired by gibbon uh, i mean there's no question about that asimov directly modeled it on it so it opens with um someone arriving in uh, the, the planet of trantor uh, and so the opening there were nearly 25 million inhabited planets in the galaxy then and not one but owed allegiance to the empire whose seat was on trantor it was the last half century in which that could be said so this is the equivalent of someone arriving in rome in 400 or is it, or is it a, a sort of uh, a veiled reference to that bit in Gibbon when Gibbon says, you know, if you had to pick an age, you would have picked the ah, age. But that's, that's several centuries before, isn't it? This is, I mean, the, the, the decline is about to happen. Okay, right. You know, it's directly about to happen. And um, the, the, the kind of the parabola of Asimov's narrative directly follows that of Gibbon. So you, you have scenes in which uh, imperial uh, plenipotentiaries visit outposts of the empire for the very last time um you get kind of interstellar equivalents of the barbarian kingdoms oh, right. yeah. um yeah. sprouting up on you know uh, planets that uh, that the empire has abandoned um, you have a you have a, a a chapter in which the empire a bit like justinian reinvading italy tries to kind of reconstitute the empire um but the foundation itself which gives its name to the series of novels is something that has been founded is a foundation by um a psycho historian a guy called harry selden right um and he's a mathematician who has applied his kind of crunching of data to the past and has drawn up rules of history so by looking to the past he's been able to work out the future and so he can tell that the empire is going to collapse and he kind of plants the foundation to serve as a beacon of light amid the gathering darkness that he knows is going to come. So it's as though he has read his gibbon and he thinks this is going to happen again, effectively. Yes, yes, pretty much. And so the whole, um, the whole uh, series of novels revolves around the fact that there are kind of what are, what are called Selden events, um, where some catastrophic thing that most people couldn't have seen, but because he can, he's a psycho historian, he's been able to work it out. Um, he knows what's going to happen. And actually, I mean, this is... I think this is a, a trend that's particularly popular in um, American uh, universities. There are historians who are very into the idea that you can kind of draw immutable lessons. So I guess the Thucydides trap would be the classic example. American sort of military historians love to talk about that, don't they? Policy makers. Yeah, so this is, yeah, yeah, so this is the idea, this is the idea that um, a, a settled power will become the rival of a, of a rising power. So Sparta goes to war with Athens. Um, Britain goes to war with Germany. It's much applied now with regard to America and China. Um, and really, this is an idea, this idea that you can have applied history is something that uh, has been very popular in the United States throughout the 20th century. And Asimov is clearly drawing on that idea, I think, with the foundation. You know who would be a good, who's Harry Selden, Tom? And Neil Ferguson. Neil Ferguson's all, yeah, all over this well, kind of thing. So Neil Ferguson did actually organise a conference on this very idea in Stanford to which uh, I was invited Tom, oh one, my word. one one of one of 19 men and one woman <laughs> right. and there was a, there was a, there was much uproar about this i believe it was called a sausage fest how did that woman get in um, i understand unbelievable <laughs> scenes um and uh, but you know it was in california i think the beast from the east was sweeping in over britain yeah. i i i went and enjoyed what did you some. do what predictions for the future did you offer i did something on undead rome I did it on looking at how uh, ideas of Rome motivated um, uh, Vladimir Putin. We, we, Crikey, we ended right. up talking about it in one of the episodes. Crikey. You know, never let anything go to waste. Anyway, so, so this, is, this is still quite current, quite a current idea. Yeah. Um, but in the context of, of 
this idea that Gibbon articulates that the fall of the Roman Empire is the greatest, perhaps, and most awful scene in the history of mankind, he famously says. Mm -hmm. um, there is a great twist in the second novel, which is that Harry Seldon's reading of history turns out to go wrong, that an event happens that he couldn't have foreseen. And this is the emergence of a character called the Mule, uh, yes. yeah. who is, uh, he's, a, he's a, a mutant telepath. Yeah. So he can read and manipulate the, uh, the, the emotions of other people. And he ends up conquering the galaxy and conquering the foundation. Um, he has not been predicted. And I think that this is pretty clearly an echo of Muhammad. It's a, it's a fairly hostile portrayal of Muhammad. Um, the, the mule is a kind of, a, he's, he's an arrogant conqueror. Mm -hmm. But I think it is an interesting twist because it w essentially what Asimov is saying there is that the emergence of Islam is a kind of, you know, a lightning bolt from the blue. It couldn't have been anticipated or foreseen. It's something so startling and unexpected that even um, the most highly advanced psycho historians could not have anticipated it. And that, of course, is buying into the traditional Islamic narrative say, that, yeah. that, that um, Islam emerges because it is uh, a revelation of God rather than emerging, uh, as I think it probably did, from actually quite predictable, uh, in quite a predictable way from the kind of the melange of, of, of opinions so if those, and religious beliefs. So if, if, if Harry Seldon is a psycho, what is he, a psycho historian? If, yeah. he'd, if he'd been trained in the sort of 1970s and 1980s, by sort of a Patricia Croner figure, Tom. Yeah, he might have seen it. He would have seen it coming because he would have said <laughs> yeah, well, Islam Fred emerged or em exactly emerged yes. out of the superpower conflicts in yeah. in, in Arabia um, yeah. between the Romans and the Persians and stuff. But I guess what Asimov is reflecting is the orthodox historiography about the rise of Islam and in the and the sort of seventh century uh, in at the time he was writing in the nineteen fifties, right? As is another equally celebrated work of science fiction, a, a series of novels like Foundation that, again, ha have inspired uh, not TV in this case, but, but but a couple of films so far that have, you know, cut out on release. And that's Dune. Right. Um, yeah. And Dune was written in the 60s by a guy called Frank Herbert. Um, and it's set on an inhospitable desert, a bit like, uh, what is it? Tatooine is it in uh, in Star Wars? So this is Arrakis, Arrakis yeah. um, and it's it's um, full of giant kind of sandworms and things. But what Arrakis produces is um, a, a kind of weird th thing called spice, yes, that effectively powers space travel, well, so, uh, which is also called melange, rather oddly. Or melange, yeah. yes. So it's, I mean, this is this is um, just before OPEC, so it's pretty clear that this is oil. You know, spice in a way yeah. is oil but i think it is clearly also an echo of um the idea that was very very current uh when herbert was writing this and and which patricia croner um delivered a kind of devastating rebuttal to the idea that mecca had been a great center of the spice trade and that um this is the context from which muhammad emerges that mecca was this hugely significant center i uh, i think it, it, it it's absolutely clear that it wasn't at all okay and that this sense of mecca as a center of spice trade is a kind of orientalist fantasy that's projected onto uh, islam's onto the understanding of islam by western scholars who have this idea that anything oriental must must have to do with spice and then it kind of is, it's turbocharged by by um by the by the oil crisis why does it matter why does it matter in the history of islam and the for sort of collapse of the roman authority in the eastern mediterranean why does it matter whether mecca was had spices or not i don't think it does particularly matter i mean it matters very much to um explaining the traditional accounts of islam um as history if you want to do i mean because in the traditional accounts, Mecca is clearly a very significant settlement yeah. with all kinds of competing aristocracies. Um, and historically, that doesn't seem to have been the case. There is no record of okay. a, a Mecca that would correspond to a centre that rich and that, that significant in any of the contemporary sources. But that idea of competing, of, of, of competing clans and aristocracies fighting for control of the spice trade, let's say, I mean, that is the plot of June. Isn't it? The Harkonnens and the and the other I can't remember what they're all called. The Atreus House Atreus, isn't it? The, the, the Greek right. name. So, so this is another. Yeah, it is. So the House of Atreus. That's the the family of Agamemnon. But it, and Paul Atreides. So Paul, the son of Atreus. Um, 
actually the the parallels are not really with greek myth it's again it's with islamic history i think because paul goes on to become um muadib which in arabic means teacher although in in dune it actually means um kangaroo mouse <laughs> right. so it's one of the animals of the yeah. of the desert and he goes on to kind of um become a prophetic figure a great lead, great religious leader there is this he he launches this jihad which ends up consuming the entire uh, galactic empire um quite quite star wars mm -hmm. um and uh, again i think that this is consciously inspired by the way that islam is a terminal event in the long run for the roman empire and suggests that you know for these very very significant deeply totemic science fiction stories it's the fall of the roman empire rather than the fall of the roman republic that is the kind of the great inspiration just one thing on paul paul is also so we talked about luke skywalker is king arthur um paul is also king arthur as well isn't he sort of uh, he, is, he has a, yeah. he has this sort of providential destiny that he is is sort of fated you know people talk about him in hushed tones is he going to be the person who fulfills the prophecy and all that kind of stuff yeah and i think that that's so interesting i mean you're absolutely right that, that there are echoes of arthur as well as of muhammad and both of them so the the, the the um the stories of arthur are starting to emerge and be written down at around the same time as the biographies of muhammad the first biographies of muhammad are starting to be written um kind of around 800 a.d and both of them are kind of responses to the collapse of the Roman Empire. They're both about the emergence of um, charismatic figures on the margins of the empire who take control of abandoned imperial territory. Mm. Um, and so that's why I think it's, it's, it's possible to see, say, in Dune, echoes both of Arthur and of Muhammad in this story, yeah. because um, the original stories are both generated by this kind of catastrophic event, if you're Roman um and it's it, and i think it's clear why science fiction offers scope for people who want to explore the kind of the you know the great dramas of ancient history but don't want to write historical fiction because if you have a, a an, an enormous galactic empire you know you can make play with that yeah. in a way that you can't just you know down on earth yes so like Battlestar Galactica would be another example oh, yeah, of that. Yeah, of course, Battlestar Galactica, which is kind of, is that Mormonism? I, 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 did, I did know this. The idea of the sort of, um, that there is this idea that it's inspired by the idea of the Mormons. Anyway, so, so Tom, do you have anything else up your sleeve? I suspect you do. Well, I know you do. <laughs> well, you know I do. So there's one, other, there's one other way in which the Roman Empire has served as an inspiration for science fiction. That is a particular and distinctive aspect of its culture, which we have already alluded to when we, we, we discussed Gladiator, which in so many ways could be thought of as a science fiction film, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, you think of those the napalm that is fired in the, the, the opening battle, the vast overweening scale with which Rome is portrayed. There's a sense in which the the examples of science fiction are being woven back into yeah. history. Or fantasy, I suppose. But or fantasy, yes. But um, gladiatorial combat has featured in um, in a number of sci of science fiction stories and um if if star if star wars is is one of the kind of the great science fiction franchises that emerged in the from the 60s and 70s the other one of course is star trek and you do get a kind of a, a roman empire in they're, they're called the romulans oh, right. so the name is obviously yes. comes from romulus so they're introduced in um, in the first series in 1966 but in the second series, which came out in 1968, you have an episode called Bread and Circuses. So the famous phrase from Juvenal, which yeah. describes what the, how the, the emperors kept the, the people of Rome happy. And in that, um, Kirk, Spock and McCoy, so the three main figures in the, in the first series, get captured by um, a civilization that is basically Rome, but in the mid 20th century. Right. And um, Spock and McCoy get made to fight as gladiators. And this is the, the, um, the, uh, the, the Roman officials who are announcing this say, it'll be shown on television in colour. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. That really dates. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Yeah, it does. So, um, and, uh, and, uh, and, the and, and again, a bit like in Star Wars, you have these kind of shadowy figures who worship, they're worshippers of the sun. Right. Um, and at the end, um, they, they, they all get, they all survive. They get beamed back up and, um, 
uh, Mr. Spock is kind of musing how how extraordinary the parallels between ancient Rome and Rome on this on this planet are. But then he says, "But I I do not remember there being." Uh, Worshippers of the sun in well, Rome. That's wrong. There were, weren't there? I mean, Sol Invictus. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. of course. But um, at this point, Lieutenant Uhura yeah. uh, pipes up and says um, that she has been monitoring broadcasts from the planet, and reveals they're not worshiping the sun S U N, but the sun S O N. Oh my word, Tom! Really? <laughs> and and uh, Captain Kirk, <laughs> Caesar and Christ, they have them both. And the word is spreading only now. Right. So that is that is very sword and sandals. Bit that of absolutely. That, I mean, that's the that's the ultimate <laughs> embodiment of kind of yeah. Cold War America, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, incredible. It is. <laughs> it is. I mean, obviously, it's a pun that doesn't work in Latin. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but I think. I mean, I think you can see why the idea of the the kind of the um the idea of gladiators the idea of people being made to fight for the entertainment of what of 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 viewers is something that is it works really really well in an era with television and with film mm -hmm. um and if you project that into the future then you have scope for you know for a whole range of of kind of plots so there's the arnie one isn't there the running the man. running man yeah uh, yeah um, but I think the most the most celebrated recent franchise where the echoes of Roma are really, really overt. Um, it's not set in space, but it is set in the future. And that's the Hunger Games. Ah. So it's set in a, a in a, in North America where the United States has imploded. Um, and there are kind of all these various outlying districts who have to send a tribute of young boys and girls where they are then made to fight the Hunger Games. They basically kind of, you know, they will have to kill each other. So it's about other. Theseus. And the last person is Theseus. So that, yeah. yeah. So, so so that is is obviously drawing on the on the Theseus myth, but the the setting is Roman. So the the idea of gladiatorial combat, um, the uh, that the capital is called Capitol. All oh, right. Um, as in the the, the capital yeah. in Rome. Um, it's uh, the city is called uh, Parnem. Um, and the the president. Uh, is Coriolanus Snow. Coriolanus Snow. So Snow, that's not Roman, but Coriolanus is. And there, you know, every, all the pretty much all the characters in it, um, apart from the heroine, have kind of classical names. There's kind of Plutarch, Cato, all kinds of people like that. Um, and I think that that's Hunger Games is a really good example of the way in which a, 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 a sprinkling of the Roman yeah. in a science fiction film, in a futuristic film. Gives it a little bit of class. Yeah, it does. I like that, Tom. I've never seen The Hunger Games. You've seen it about 30 times, haven't you? Yeah, I have, because my daughter's loved it. Yeah, them. see, I'm not a teenage girl, so I've never seen it. So, um, but maybe, is it good? Yeah, it's great. Really? Crikey. Yeah, So, and it has Woody Harrelson, who I <laughs> um, I, I saw on the the uh, London stage a couple of weeks ago. Did you? What was he doing? He was in a brilliant play called, I think, uh, American Ulster, or Ulster American. I can't remember which way around it was. And he's with Andy Serkis. You saw it two weeks ago and you don't remember what it was called? What is uh, Ulster American or American Ulster? Okay. I can't remember. Okay. Uh, and a girl from, uh, an actress from Derry Girls. Okay. It's really, really funny. I highly recommend Thank it. Thank you. This, this conversation should have been unexpected. Yeah, I know. We didn't think we'd end up, um, <laughs> end up with that, so, talking about Derry Girls. So, last question. What is it? Why Rome? Why not Greece? Why not? I mean, obviously, I guess not Persia, not another empire, because it's Rome that is at the center that it that, that sort of underlies the western imagination is that what is that the, the argument it's glamorous it's got great visuals um it uh it can stand in for uh, sinister empires whether it's the british empire or the nazis or the soviet union or whatever mm -hmm. but it it has a kind of iconography that's immediately recognizable um it has customs that we find unsettling, yeah. but exciting. Well, violence, basically. So violence, um, so slavery yeah. and gladiatorial combat and whips and all kinds of things that when you look at those films in the 50s, yeah. there's a kind of a, a clear kind of say. There's a hell of a lot of whipping in those element films. In it. There's yeah. a lot of whipping in it. Um, and um, it's also quite, quite classy, I think. Yeah. I mean, you know, the study of, of Latin is has been a kind of marker of class right from the beginning of the American Republic. So, And I suppose you could argue that in most, that, that in our kind of political imagination, those two events, the evolution of the Republic into an empire and then the decline and fall of the empire, 
that those are kind of foundational, aren't they? That they are, you know, that all, almost all political creeds have them, have some sense of them at their heart somewhere. Anyway. Yeah. Well, it, I, I mean, as you know, to repeat Gibbon, it, it is the greatest and most awful scene. And maybe you need, uh, maybe you need the galaxy to truly do it yes, justice. Yes, you do, Tom. We certainly began this podcast with the greatest and most awful impression. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, do you know what? It was a pretty good Dave Prowse. I mean, it's not... It's not <laughs> I thought it was. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. it's not... Uh, um, it's very similar to the impression that you did, for our American listeners will enjoy this, of, of John Adams, the uh, founding oh, well, father that's... of the United States, because <laughs> that, of course, is how early Americans spoke. <laughs> right, on that bombshell, Tom, um, I, I actually enjoyed that this episode far more than is healthy. Um, I hope, I, and that's a terrible thing to say at your own episodes because it makes us look <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> very self indulgent. Yeah, but uh, but we need it. We needed it after all the Nazis. A palate cleanser, and, I think, and people being locked up in iron masks. Exactly. So um, we will be back. Uh, we'll be back, I believe, Tom, with the reign of King Richard II. We will. And the, and the peasants, peasants revolt. revolt and all kinds of exciting goings on in medieval England. So we will see you next week. Bye bye. Bye bye. 